by name in scripture, but it is a truth that is seen throughout the Bible. So what is irresistible grace? Well, it is the sovereign work of God in an unsaved person's life whereby the Lord overcomes their resistance to the gospel by bestowing on them his grace in saving them. Simply put, irresistible grace means that when God decides to work in the heart of an individual who has been resisting him, that individual eventually will give up their resistance and come to Christ for salvation. Jesus put it this way in John 6, 44. He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, this is irresistible grace in action. It is the power of God at work drawing someone who otherwise would not come to Christ for salvation. This particular Greek word that is translated in our English Bibles, draw, has the thought of compelling force. Compelling force. It is, the, it is the very same word used in other Greek literature of a fisherman dragging a net or a people being dragged by a mob, making, in both cases, resistance impossible. They're dragged. Resistance is impossible. And that's exactly what happens when a sinner is drawn to Christ. In spite of their history of resistance of the gospel, it is impossible for them to continue to resist when the Holy Spirit compels them to Christ. And the reason this irresistible drawing and compelling is necessary is because without it, no one would ever come to Jesus for salvation. See, contrary to what some people think, no one is born into this world with a, a neutral attitude towards God, which can go either one way or another. That's not what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that we were all born into this world with sinful natures, meaning that at the very core of our being, we are bent on rebelling against God. And therefore, we resist any gospel witness made to us about trusting Christ as Lord and Savior. In fact, the scripture says that we oppose God, we hate God until we are converted. We're not neutral. We're hostile towards him. The Apostle Paul makes the point of this universal condition of resistance and rebellion very clear in his letter to the Ephesians. Here's what Paul said in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, Paul says, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Folks, this was our condition before salvation. All of us, every single one of us. Now, the reason that I'm bringing up the doctrine of irresistible grace this morning is because we find our, ourselves these days in a study of the book of Acts, specifically Acts chapter 7, where, as we've seen, Stephen, the first one who'd ever be martyred for the faith, Stephen is forced to defend himself before the supreme court of Israel on the false accusation that he has spoken against Moses and the law of God, and as well as against the temple of of God that stood at that time in the city of Jerusalem. But in the process of presenting his defense, Stephen turns the tables on the men of the Sanhedrin by making a stunning accusation against them. He accuses them. Remember, they are the religious leaders of his nation. He accuses them of being just like their ancestors in Old Testament times, because like their ancestors, whom he calls the fathers, he says they always resist God and his truth. They did it back then, you're doing it now. If you look at Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 53, and I keep coming back to this these days, because this is the climax of the message. This is where Stephen is headed. In fact, this is what got Stephen killed. Stephen killed. 
He says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now, what Stephen means by all of this is that in spite of all the biblical truth that these men have been exposed to, remember, they've known the scriptures since they've been very, very young. In spite of all the biblical truth that they've been exposed to, they continue to resist the Holy Spirit's voice by disregarding what he has said through the Old Testament prophets about the coming Messiah. In fact, they are so resistant and so unresponsive to what the Holy Spirit has said that they actually killed the Messiah when he came. The Messiah who their, their own prophets predicted would come. See, the men of the Sanhedrin are a perfect illustration of why the truth of God's irresistible grace is important. It's so important. And it is so essential for salvation. These men... As I said, they were very familiar with the scriptures. They knew the Bible. These men witnessed firsthand the miracles of Jesus. They saw those miracles with their own eyes. And they heard his remarkable teaching, his remarkable wisdom, and yet they rejected him and murdered him. So how do we explain this? How is this even possible? Well, their resistance can only be explained by the fact that it stems from being dead in their sins and trespasses, as Paul said. They were incapable of responding to God because dead people can't respond. They can respond spiritually, or physically rather, but we're talking about being spiritually dead. They're unresponsive. They were living in the lusts of their flesh, behaving in accordance with their sinful heart's desires, so they chose to not have Christ reign over them. They were quite content in their sin and dead in their sin. And the only way any of the men of the Sanhedrin would ever stop resisting the Holy Spirit is if God intervened in their lives with his irresistible grace and drew them to himself. Now, he actually did this a little bit later, as we'll see in the book of Acts, with one of the members of the Sanhedrin, a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus, who became the apostle Paul. And concerning the Sanhedrin's resistance to the Holy Spirit and people's resistance today to the Holy Spirit, theologian R.C. Sproul wrote these words. He said, irresistible grace does not mean that we are incapable of resisting the grace of God. We do that every day. What is meant by irresistible grace is that despite our resistance, the power of the Holy Spirit vanquishes our sinful rejection of Christ and gives us ears to hear and hearts to embrace him. However, that was not the response of those present, which is why Stephen said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. He continues, anytime a large group gathers for worship, it is virtually inevitable that among their number, there are some who are not true believers. They may be members of the church, but they still resist the Holy Spirit, and their necks have become stiff. They are set in their ways, and their hearts have been calcified. They have no hearing in their ears for the things of God. Oh, they hear the sermons, but it never gets past the outer canal of their ears. There are people like that right now in all our churches. Now, folks, the reason it's important for us to understand these issues about resisting the Lord is because in the section of Stephen's defense that we are going to study this morning. He proves his point that the Jewish people have a history of resisting the Holy Spirit, and he does it by revealing how they rejected and continually resisted their divinely appointed leader, Moses. And the relevancy of all of this concerning Jewish history for us is that people do the same thing today. This is not a Jewish issue. This is a human heart issue. We resist the Spirit. We reject Christ for the very same reason. As R.C. Sproul said, there are people in churches who hear the sermons, but it never gets past, he said, the outer canal of their ears. What he means is it just never penetrates the heart. It doesn't go deeper 
than what you physically hear. And so they continue to resist the Holy Spirit because they want to live by their own set of rules, their own standards, or as Paul puts it, according to the lusts of their flesh. So as we go through these verses in which Stephen explains the Jewish resistance to to Moses, I want to draw out the principles, the principles that are timeless and for all of us, and so that we might understand what resistance to the Holy Spirit looks like and the underlying causes of such resistance with the hope that the Lord will use these truths to awaken some to their own resistance and their need for Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So as we continue our study of Stephen's message before the Sanhedrin, I remind you of what we studied last week. Having been wrongfully accused of speaking against Moses and the law of God, Stephen defends himself by saying only positive things about Moses. He divides Moses' life into three 40-year time periods. And he spends verses 17 through 29 speaking of the first 40 years of the life of Moses, where he explains that Moses, though highly qualified to be Israel's deliverer, he was initially rejected by the Jewish people when he intervened in a couple of disputes on two consecutive days. The first dispute ended with Moses killing an Egyptian who was mistreating a fellow Jew. The Bible says he buried the man in the sand. He didn't think anybody saw. But the very next day, he tried to intervene in a second dispute And it resulted in Moses fleeing Egypt for the land of Midian when he realized that others had discovered his act of murder and therefore he knew that his life was in danger and he had to leave. Now the primary purpose of Stephen in telling the Sanhedrin about these two incidents is to make the point that the Jewish people, instead of receiving Moses as their leader, as they should have done, they rejected him. And where Stephen is headed with this fact is that he is soon going to connect the dots for the Sanhedrin so that they can see that there is a correlation, a connection between the Jewish people and them in particular rejecting Jesus Christ as the ultimate deliverer. The Jewish people rejected Moses. They have rejected Jesus as well. There is a pattern that emerges. See, although Moses thought that the Jewish people would recognize him as their God-sent deliverer, Stephen tells us they didn't. They didn't recognize him. They should have. They reacted to his attempt to resolve their disputes. The Bible says they, they pushed him away. They physically pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? In other words, they rejected him as their deliverer, and so he fled to the desert area of Midian, where he lived for the next 40 years. Verse 29 says this, At this remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, this is where the first 40 years of the life of Moses ends. And this is where we left off last week. And so, starting in verse 30, Stephen moves on to speak about the second 40-year period of the life of Moses, the 40 years that Moses spent in Midian. So we move on to that, verse 30. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. Now, interestingly, Stephen passes over the next 40 years of Moses' life in Midian until he comes to the end of this time period to tell us about an event that was to change the course of Moses' life and the course of human history. He tells us about the day that an angel appeared to Moses in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. Exodus 3, 1 and 2 gives us the background of what Stephen is now saying. We read, now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. Now, what we read here is that Moses was taking care of his father-in-law's 
flock out in the wilderness. And apparently this had been his occupation for all of these years. He had been a shepherd for 40 years, a very different life than he had known in the royal court of Egypt. So he's a, a shepherd, and he's an experienced shepherd. He's been doing this a lot of years. He's spent countless hours out in the wilderness, and so he's very familiar with the ways of the, the desert. He's not a novice. But on this particular day, he saw something he had never seen before. In all of these years, he had never seen this. He saw a thorn bush on fire. Now, that in and of itself, that's, that's really not unusual. It happens a lot in the desert. But what was unusual about this burning bush was that it wasn't consumed by the fire. It, it just kept burning and didn't stop. It didn't burn out. So according to Exodus 3.3, Moses said this. He said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. Now, little did Moses realize that what he was observing was a miracle. It was a supernatural event because as he approached the burning bush to get a, a better look, he heard God's voice speak to him from out of the bush. And as Stephen continues, he explains what happened and what God said to Moses on that day. And so we continue, verses 31 through 34. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans, and I have come down to rescue them. Come now, and I will send you to Egypt. So as Moses drew closer to the bush, frankly, got the surprise of his life. The voice of God spoke to him from out of the bush, telling him that he was the God of his fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And in identifying himself this way, God is making a very clear statement to Moses that he is the one who years earlier made a covenant with Abraham and affirmed it with Isaac and affirmed it with Jacob. It was a covenant we usually call it the Abrahamic covenant to care for the descendants of Abraham, to care for the Jewish people. And what he was doing in speaking to Moses is reaffirming that covenant with him. So this is a solemn moment in the life of Moses, not simply because God was speaking to him, but because God was speaking to him about something that involved keeping his word, his covenant, his faithfulness to his people and Moses knew that it involved him. And so, what was Moses' reaction to all of this? Well, you've read here, he trembled with fear. He looked away from the burning bush. And the reason he did this is because he realized that he was in the presence of holy God. And that's exactly how someone should react when God appears to them. And I point this out to you because in our day, there have been some who have claimed that they have had a vision of God or that God has appeared to them or that they have been to heaven and spoken to the Lord and now they're back on earth. Listen, none of these claims are true, not because I say this, but because Scripture says this. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, makes it very clear that God is not speaking to us in visions and appearances anymore like he did in Old Testament times. Because why? Now we have the completed revelation of God. We have the word of God, which is referred to in Hebrews chapter 1 as God speaking in his son. Let me read this to you. Hebrews opens this way. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, meaning Old Testament times, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, in these days, he has spoken to us in his son. He's not speaking to us like he used to. Visions and dreams and appearances. He's speaking to us now in the last days. And the last days started with the coming of Jesus. He's speaking to us now in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. 
But listen, one thing these fallacious claims have in common, these claims of having seen God, is that they often speak of this experience in a very flippant way, a, a very lighthearted way, as if it's almost a trivial thing. Oh yeah, God appeared to me last week, and, and we talked, and we're good. That, that type of, of tone. In fact, I, I know of a man who said that Jesus appeared to him while he was shaving. And the man who, who he said this to said, what did you do? And he said, well, I kept on shaving. Listen, that's not what happens when God appears to you. You don't keep on shaving. You don't do anything but fall on your face and recognize how sinful you are to be in the presence of, of God. When God appeared to Moses, this is what Moses did. He trembled in fear because he, he knew that being a sinful human being, that's how you react when you are in the presence of almighty, holy God. You don't continue doing anything. You fall on your face, you tremble, you look away. You recognize your sinful heart. This is precisely the reaction of Isaiah in the Old Testament and the Apostle John in the New Testament when they were given a glimpse of God. In Isaiah 6, we read this. Verse 1, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. This is what Isaiah said. He was given a vision. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim, those are angels, they, they stood above him, each having six wings with two. He covered his face. Why did he cover his face? Even a holy angel couldn't look upon God's full holiness and glory. He covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to, to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of, of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I, this is Isaiah, this is Isaiah's response. Then I said, woe is me for I am ruined. I'm undone. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. That is how you respond to being in God's presence. The Apostle John had a very similar experience in Revelation 1.17. He was given a glimpse of the glorified Jesus. And John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And folks, that was essentially the reaction of Moses too. Because he knew that he was in the presence of pure holiness. And God affirmed that this was the case by telling Moses to remove his sandals from off of his feet because the place where he was standing, meaning in his presence, that now was holy ground. Now, apart from the fact that this is what the book of Exodus tells us concerning God appearing to Moses, there's a very specific reason that Stephen mentions that the place where Moses was standing was holy ground. As you'll recall, in addition to being accused of speaking against Moses, Stephen also has been accused of speaking against the temple of God. The temple that in that day stood in the city of Jerusalem, and the Jewish people of that day thought that, that in the temple that was the one and only place on earth where God dwells and meets with his people. They were wrong. They were wrong. And Stephen has already defended himself against this, this charge by stating that God's presence was with Abraham when Abraham was in a foreign land called Mesopotamia. He also said that God was with and present with Joseph when he was in the foreign land of Egypt, proving, and this is his point, proving that God's presence is not limited to the temple at all. And here, with Moses, he's making another statement affirming the same exact truth because he's very clearly stating that God's holy presence was in the land of Midian when God appeared to Moses there. In other words, he's, he's saying that God's, wherever God is, that's where holiness is. And, and I want to show you that this, this thought ties in. If you look back at chapter 6, verse 13, notice the language of Stephen's accusers, and it might be a little bit clear, clearer. In that verse, chapter 6, 13, 
we read, they put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly, meaning Stephen, speaks against, now notice, they call it this holy place and the law. They didn't call it the temple, this holy place, that's what they mean. And, and they refer to it as this holy place. And so in answer to this charge, Stephen is now saying that holy ground is not limited to the holy temple or even the holy land of Israel. A place becomes holy Wherever God is, that's his point. And God was in Midian, appearing to Moses and speaking out of a burning bush. And the reason the Lord did this was because he was concerned, as he tells Moses, he was concerned for his people, the Jewish people, the covenant people. He was concerned because he had promised to protect them, to care for them. And he says that he has seen the oppression of the Egyptians, and he's not indifferent to the groans of his people. So now he's going to demonstrate his faithfulness to Israel, his faithfulness to keep his word by sending Moses back to Egypt to deliver them. Now, before proceeding any further, I, I, I want to pause here for a moment to point out something that I, I realize, while it is not the intention of Stephen's message, is nonetheless an important truth that's worth noting. That truth being that for 40 years, for 40 years, God had been preparing Moses for this specific task of leading Israel by training him in the desert. I should say the last 40 years. See, 40 years prior to this, Moses felt like he was ready to lead Israel out of Egypt, but he wasn't ready. He thought they would understand that he was the deliverer, but they didn't understand, and he wasn't ready to lead them out of Egypt. It took another 40 years of behind the scenes divine training in the desert to get Moses ready by making him into the kind of man, the kind of man of God that the Lord wanted him to be so that he could serve the Lord effectively. And listen, Moses isn't the only one this has ever happened to. David, we read in scripture, spent many years being a shepherd to his father's sheep, not even his own sheep, his father's sheep, as God was preparing him to be the shepherd king over Israel. And Paul, shortly after he was converted, spent three years in the Arabian desert until he was ready to carry on an effective ministry. Listen, do not be discouraged, disheartened, if you are not being used by God like you would like him to use you. Learn from Moses you're not ready yet. You're not ready yet to be in an enlarged ministry. You still need more preparation. You still need more training in the desert by the Lord. So be patient. Concentrate on learning the lessons that God has for you. And those lessons usually concern character development. We're not talking about just learning Greek and Hebrew and going to seminary. We're talking about character development let the Lord shape you and mold you <coughs> into the kind of individual who he has equipped for the task that he has for you. So be patient. Now with Moses, it took 80 years for God to prepare him. 40 in Egypt, 40 in Midian. But now God says that he's ready to be sent back to Egypt to deliver the Jewish people from the oppression of the Egyptians. And the timing of this was absolutely perfect, as it always is with the Lord. Because as you'll recall, God told Abraham that for 400 years, the Jewish people would be foreigners, aliens in a foreign land. Just 400 years. That time is coming to a close now. The 400 years are almost up. And that's an approximate. It's actually 430 years. And God, being faithful, is about to keep his word to bring out of bondage the Jewish people. And he would do it by sending them Moses. Now, up to this point, Stephen has just been restating the historical accounts of Moses from the book of Exodus, telling the Sanhedrin things that they were all very familiar with. He didn't tell them anything they, they didn't know concerning the first 40 years of Moses' life in Egypt, then when he thought that God had called him to deliver Israel, and then the second 40 years of his life in Median, when God had called him to deliver Israel. They know this. They've been raised on this. They could read the Old Testament just like, like he could. 
But now, watch this, as Stephen proceeds to speak about the third and the final 40-year period of Moses' life, he stops giving the historical account of this man, and he starts speaking, he starts making comments about the significance of God sending Moses back to Egypt to deliver his people. So we move now to the third and final 40 years of the life of Moses while he's in Egypt and also includes the Exodus wanderings. So we read in verses 35 through 36. This Moses, whom they disown, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, notice how Stephen has moved from giving the history of Moses to now he's making comments about Moses. And his comments have to do with the fact that the Jewish people have rejected Moses. He tells the Sanhedrin that in spite of the fact that God sent Moses to deliver the Jewish people, they rejected him. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? He's the one who God sent to be both a, a ruler and a deliverer. Did you catch that? This Moses, this is the one. They said, no, God said, I'm sending him to you. And in spite of the fact, as the next verse says, that God authenticated Moses as his appointed deliverer by giving him the ability to perform signs and wonders, they still rejected him. This man, he says, led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, the wilderness for 40 years. This man they rejected. He led them out. Listen, Moses is revered today by the Jewish people. But he was not revered in his day. Although Moses is now looked upon, this is not an exaggeration, Moses is looked upon as the greatest figure in Jewish history. In his day, he was initially rejected by the Jewish people. And even after he led them out of Egypt doing miraculous signs to validate his calling as their deliverer, they still continued to rebel against his leadership. In spite of what some people may think, the history of the Jewish people is a history of rejecting those whom God has sent to her. This isn't only true of Moses. It's also true of the Old Testament prophets. Those men we deeply admire today, but they were not admired in their day. Listen to what Jesus said said concerning the pattern of Israel in rejecting God's spokesman. He said this, Matthew chapter 23, starting at verse 29, and then we're going to jump to verse 37. I'll let you know when. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Jesus said, so you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. What he's saying is, you did murder them. You have the same spirit in your heart that they had. You've admitted they are your fathers. You are their sons. You would have done the same thing. Then jump to verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you'll not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What he is saying is, although the Jewish leaders of his day spoke well of the prophets and they honored them, it was hypocrisy. He called them hypocrites because they had, as I said, the same hostile spirit as their ancestors who murdered the prophets. And Jesus said, as he lamented over the people of Jerusalem, that their history, their history is one of killing the prophets sent to her. And she would soon reject him as the Messiah, the ultimate prophet, king, priest, and they would murder him. And he said, you'll not see me again until the nations converted and you say, blessed 
is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's him as he returns. Listen, the long history of Israel reveals a terrible pattern of rejecting God's deliverers and spokesmen. Moses, the prophets, finally Jesus the Messiah. But Jewish people often forget this fact of history because it is not uncommon to hear an unsaved Jewish person say something, something like this. Listen, if Jesus really was the Messiah, as you say he, he was, then certainly the rabbis of his day would have recognized him. They would have believed in him, but they didn't. They rejected him, so he must be a fraud. Now, that is a very common argument by Jewish people. But those who say this forget the facts. They forget that the Jewish people initially rejected Moses, and they don't consider him a fraud now. And prior to rejecting Moses, they initially rejected Joseph, but they don't consider him a fraud now. And sadly, their history reveals that they rejected all of the prophets. And they certainly were no frauds. So it shouldn't be shocking that when the Messiah came, they rejected him too. No wonder Stephen will soon tell the Sanhedrin that they always resist the Holy Spirit because that's exactly what they have done and what they have continued to do. And what makes their resistance and their rejection of Jesus so remarkable is that Moses even gave the Jewish people a very specific prophetic promise of the Messiah's coming. So why did he do this? So that they shouldn't have missed him at all. Notice how Stephen puts this in verse 37. He said, this is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren. This is, this is a quote from Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, in which Moses makes this marvelous prophecy that God will raise up from amongst the Jewish people, the brethren, a prophet who will be like him in terms of his ministry to Israel, be very similar. In other words, this individual would deliver them, as Moses did. <laughs> this individual would do signs and wonders amongst them, as Moses did. And this individual would give the people God's revelation, his word, as Moses did. And the Jewish people of Christ's day, they knew very well that this statement by Moses was a reference to the coming Messiah. How do we know that they understood it to be that, that they interpreted it that way? Because they said it themselves in the New Testament. Listen to John 6, 14. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, that's the sign Jesus had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who's to come into the world. They got it. They understood Again, in John 7, 40, some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. These people understood this. They acknowledged that Jesus was that prophet who Moses said would come, meaning the Messiah. They got it. But the majority of the people, including the Sanhedrin, they rejected Jesus when it should have been so very clear to them. Moses said it, but it wasn't clear to them. Not at all, because they constantly resisted the Holy Spirit. That's what happens. Clear things become unclear when you resist the Spirit of God. They resisted the truth about Jesus, and their hearts just grew colder and harder towards him. Listen to these insightful words by John MacArthur. He writes, Had the Sanhedrin been willing to consider the facts, they could not have missed the parallels between their nation's history and their behavior toward Jesus. Nor could they have missed the parallels between Jesus and Moses. Moses humbled himself by leaving Pharaoh's palace. Jesus humbled himself by becoming a man. Moses was rejected at first, so was Jesus. Moses was a shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. Moses redeemed his people from bondage in Egypt. Jesus redeems man from bondage to sin. The history of Moses foreshadows the history of Jesus Christ. He's absolutely right. So Stephen has made it abundantly clear that Moses was rejected by the Jewish people. But listen closely, because Stephen hasn't been merely accused of speaking against Moses as a person. Remember, he's been accused of speaking against Moses as the lawgiver, the one who delivered the law from God to the people. So now having stated his case that Moses, as their deliverer, was rejected by the Jewish people, Stephen moves on 
to state that the Jewish people also rejected Moses as their lawgiver as well as the very law itself. Notice verse 38. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. <coughs> now with these words, Stephen has made a transition. He has transitioned from Moses being sent back to Egypt to deliver the Jewish people to Moses now leading the Jewish people out of Egypt into the wilderness where he received the law of God on Mount Sinai to deliver to the people of God. Now, notice what Stephen calls God's laws. He refers to them as living oracles, meaning that these laws are, are living words from the, from the living God. They're not dead words, just as the writer to the Hebrews puts it. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword. And the reason Stephen calls the law the living oracles of God is because, remember, he's been accused of blaspheming the law, speaking against the law. He probably said that the law could not save anybody's soul, which he's absolutely right. But here he's making it clear that he holds the law in the highest esteem. Yes, it can't save anybody, but he holds it in the highest esteem because these laws are the, are the living oracles, the revelation of the living God. And these living oracles were given to Moses to pass on to the children of Israel. And that's exactly what he did. So the real issue is this. What did the people do with these living oracles? Well, we read further in verses 39 and 41. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him in their, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. At that time they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Now Stephen says that even though God gave Moses his laws for the Jewish people, they were unwilling to obey Moses and once again, they rejected him, not only as their deliverer, but also now as their lawgiver. And they longed in their hearts to return to Egypt. Amazing. Amazing as it sounds, the people who were so cruelly treated and oppressed in Egypt, they felt it would be better to go back there than to continue following Moses in the wilderness and obeying God's laws. And Stephen tells us in verses 40 and 41 that the people's rejection of Moses, listen to this, it ran so deep that while he was up on Mount Sinai receiving the law, the living oracles, they asked his brother, Aaron, to make some idols for them to worship, idols who would go before them and would lead them. And as a result, they ended up worshiping a golden calf and they forgot about Moses. Now, folks, this is one of the most unusual events that you will ever read in the Old Testament. And if it wasn't so serious, it actually would be humorous. I say that because here's what we read in Exodus 32, verses 1 through 4. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold earrings which were in their ears, brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand, fashioned it with a graving tool, and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now after Moses, we, we read, came down from Mount Sinai, and he saw what happened. Obviously he was angry, very upset. We're told that he threw down the tablets of the Ten Commandments, broke them. Then he burned the golden calf to powder, scattered the powder on the water, made the sons of Israel drink it. What's really strange is what Aaron says to Moses when he's confronted. Exodus 32, verses 21, 24. Then Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you brought such great sin upon them? Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself, that they're prone to evil. For they said to me, make us, or make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him, what's become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Now, <laughs> did you catch what he said? <laughs> 
He said, I threw the gold into the fire and voila, out popped this calf, golden calf. Now, if you believe this, you are very likely to believe that Elvis is in the house. I mean, this is uh, how ridiculous an excuse. But what it does reveal is the spiritual level of the people of Israel. When Aaron, the man who would become the high priest, accommodated their desire to worship an idol and then makes up this ludicrous story of a golden calf just popping out of the fire. Listen, <coughs> what Stephen wants us to understand is that he's not the one who's guilty of rebelling against the law of God, the Jewish people are, led now by the Sanhedrin. Their whole history is a history of disobedience towards the law. And it started here in the wilderness when they turned a golden calf to be their God. And why a golden calf? Because the worship of calves was a central part of the religion of the Egyptians. And what that tells us is that the Israelites, when they were living in Egypt, they joined in the worship, the, the idolatrous worship that the Egyptians had of these calves. And that's why they longed to return to, to Egypt, because their hearts were there. Uh, they may have physically left the country, but their hearts were back there in that idolatrous culture. See, Stephen's accusation against the Sanhedrin, that they always resist the Holy Spirit, that's an accusation against the entire nation, led by them, but the entire nation of Israel. They resisted God in Egypt, they resisted him in the wilderness, and they continued to resist God throughout their Old Testament history, as Stephen tells us in verses 42 and 43. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. When the Jewish people turned away from God, Stephen tells us that God turned away from them. And he did it by delivering them up to serve and worship the host of heaven. What he means by this is this is an act of divine judgment. God let them pursue what their sinful hearts wanted to pursue all along, idols. Specifically, the sun, the moon, stars, it's the host of heaven. That's what they wanted. God said, in judgment, I let you pursue them. This is really the same type of judgment Paul will speak about in Romans chapter 1 concerning God abandoning the Gentiles to do those sins that their evil hearts wanted to do. God did the same thing to the Jewish people. He let them do what their hearts wanted to do, and that was worship false gods. And that's exactly what they did throughout the Old Testament. That's where their hearts were. They did this all during their 40 years of wanderings. That's what Stephen tells us in the wilderness. They did this when they settled in the land of Israel. And they continued to do this until the day that they were taken captive to the land of Babylon. That's precisely what the middle of, of verses 42 and then verse 43 are talking about. He's quoting from Amos chapter 5. God says that although they offered animal sacrifices during their wilderness wanderings and they said that it was for me... They said that, but it wasn't. It wasn't to me that they offered these sacrifices. It was to their idolatrous idols. Two of these false gods are even mentioned here. Moloch, that was the Canaanite sun god. And Rampha, that was one of the Egyptian gods involving the planets. See, what God's word says is that what Stephen is telling the Sanhedrin is that the nation of Israel has a long history of idolatry. Even when they said that they were worshiping the one true God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they weren't. Most of the people were only giving lip service to God. Yes, there were some godly people. The majority were only giving lip service to God because in their hearts, they really were worshiping heavenly bodies. See, most people have a misunderstanding when it comes to the history of the Jewish people. They think that Old Testament Israel was, at, at times, maybe a little naughty, but mostly nice, mostly obedient to God and his laws. Folks, that's not true. That's not true. That's not at all the case. They were constantly disobedient, constantly resisting the Holy Spirit as they persistently worshipped false 
gods. No wonder they rejected Jesus. He came to his own, and his own received him not. They weren't interested in him because Jesus spoke the truth about their sin, their need to repent, their need to obey the holy demands of God. They pretended to be religious. They pretended to be zealous in obeying God, but it was all a pretense for the most part and the majority. Jesus said that they worship God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. I hope that's not true of you because Jewish people are not unique in resisting the Lord. It is the natural inclination of the human heart to resist God. So could you, could you be someone who claims to be a Christian, but your heart is just far from God? It's all a pretense. You say that you're interested in the Bible and obeying it, but you resist God's word by constantly disobeying his word, disregarding his word. If that's the case, then recognize your sin. Recognize your sin, repent of it now. Turn to Christ before your heart becomes so hard that you're not interested at all. You're not hearing anything. Turn to him, trust him for your salvation. Don't deceive yourself into thinking you're a Christian when your heart is far from the Lord and you continue as a lifestyle to rebel and resist him. And if you are a Christian, make sure that you're not resisting the Holy Spirit about an issue or some issues that he's been dealing with you for some time over. Obey, or he'll discipline you. Obey. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what we've heard this morning, and I pray that you'll do a work of grace, Lord, in the hearts of some who don't know you, who may be resisting you. As R.C. Sproul said, our churches are filled with people who may be members of the church, but they resist the Holy Spirit, and they've never turned to Christ for salvation. And so, Lord, we pray that any here who are in that condition would be just awoken by you to the truth, and that you would show them their need for Christ. For those, Lord, who are believers and yet still resist you, something you've been dealing with them on, and they maybe have heard it over and over and over again, and they're still not getting it, I pray that they'll get it, and they'll be obedient no matter what the cost is. Now, Lord, we've heard your word. Do a work in us as we leave here that we might ponder these things, that we might think about these issues of resisting you, that we might understand more and more who you are, how wonderful you are, how you work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hopefully we will see you tonight. You are dismissed.